Prime Minister Harold Macmillan met President Eisenhower to sign an agreement that would change Britain's relationship with America forever. But just days before, a fire had broken out at Windscale, the country's first nuclear reactor. I looked down onto a blazing inferno. Britain was on the brink of an unprecedented disaster. If it goes up, we will all go with it. The fire threatened to destroy the special relationship before it began. You can imagine bottom dropping out of Macmillan's stomach. Facing humiliation, Macmillan decided to keep the truth about Britain's worst nuclear disaster secret. He covered it up, plain and simple. Now, secret tape recordings reveal the reasons behind Macmillan's cover-up. At first, they said if it went over 1,200, oh, God help us. And why the men and women who fought the fire felt he betrayed them. This is a story of political spin before the phrase was invented and how Britain's nuclear hopes turned into a nuclear nightmare. I have never been so frightened in my whole life. Mankind had not faced anything like this ever before. For a country that had suffered six years of war, Windscale was a symbol of the new Britain, a symbol of hope. It was a massive engineering project employing thousands of people at the frontiers of science. It was the first big construction site that I'd ever been on. It was like Meccano on a very large scale. Oh, it was a terrific achievement, really. Yes. Uh, there was a lot of people who worked on that. And these were huge projects. I mean, they wouldn't be considered huge today, but then they were. From 1947, the building of Britain's first nuclear reactor at Windscale took on epic proportions. 4,000 tonnes of graphite were used to build the two reactors. The walls were seven feet thick, the chimney 400 feet high. Occasionally they let me drive their cranes and it, it was fun, it was like sort of model railways on a larger scale. The windscale reactor was um, a marvellous way of cutting our teeth. This, is, this sounds very egocentric, but this is to some extent the way that science goes. You do it because it's fun. Suddenly, science was sexy. Good morning. More VIPs? No, boffins. Everybody loves a lover. I'm a lover. Everybody loves me. Anyhow, that's how I feel. Wow, I feel just like a Pollyanna. It was just part of this feeling that science is going to, has done great things, can do great things, and will do great things, and we were just part of it. If um, one of us went to a conference, there might be newspaper headline, uh, Atom Man will be there. It was very, very heady. More than 5,000 Atom men and women landed in a small part of the northwest of England. The locals came up with their own names for the invaders. Probably the favourite was the Atomics to describe the new people in the village. I can remember um, all laughing one morning because of the headline, Britain's Atom Age Heroes. And you did feel that uh, we were in the vanguard of bringing something really new. Men dressed like visitors from Mars had a slightly sinister touch to the hospital atmosphere of the laboratory. The local town of Seascale, just a few hundred yards from the site, was becoming Britain's first atomic town. 
Seascale was an absolutely marvellous place to grow up, it really was. There were golf classes, a riding school, ballroom dancing classes, ballet classes, dance, tea dances even, in the Windscale Club. And all the um, physicists and their wives who came in were new from university, so it was a very young, vibrant population. All the people were uh, young and ambitious and uh, keen, alive. There was chemists, there was teachers, there was physicists, there was all kinds of people. People from all over the world. We all got on wonderfully well and uh, it really was, it was quite exciting. Seascale was called the brainiest town in Britain. It was the biggest concentration of honours degrees and PhDs of anywhere in the country. Well, it was quite hilarious at school. We couldn't have a physics teacher because they couldn't get anyone to come and teach us. And apparently it was because all the homework that came in, all the physics homework, the standard of it was far in advance of anything the physics teachers had ever heard of. The class my daughter was in, every child in the class passed the 11 plus which had been unknown before. In a Britain still emerging from war, Windscale gave people hope. From a point of view of someone just leaving universities and starting a new job, it was great because I was thrown in immediately with 20 or 30 or perhaps more other, mainly men, all in the same boat and we were all staying at the whole hostel together so we all went rock climbing together and we all played rugby together and uh, got drunk together and went to the dance every Friday night in the hostel itself, which was quite the local scene. But Windscale wasn't built to fulfil the dreams of Britain's young atomic heroes. It was built to make bombs. At 8.15 in the morning of August 6th, Japanese time, the first atomic bomb struck an enemy target. The bomb which had ended the war was now seen as the means of keeping the peace. Britain believed its status as a world power was guaranteed by its relationship with America and their joint stewardship of the atom bomb. Neither the sure prevention of war nor the continuous rise of world organization will be gained without a special relationship between the British Commonwealth and Empire and the United States of America. Churchill believed Britain and America had formed a lasting nuclear partnership when British scientists helped build the atom bomb. Although the Americans had financed the bomb project at Los Alamos, a crucial contribution had been made by some of Britain's most brilliant scientists. But not everyone believed in a nuclear partnership between Britain and America. They created this war-winning weapon. The American taxpayer created it. Two billion dollars was spent on it. Unimaginable sum of money. And they felt in 1945 that the best way of ensuring that, uh, first of all, America stayed on top, and secondly, that there weren't nuclear wars uh, in, you know, with rival nuclear powers, was to keep this thing to ourselves. It's ours. We paid for it. We're going to keep it to ourselves. The idea that the United States was the ideal caretaker for this profound and dangerous knowledge. Uh, you can smell the, the, the smoke of, of superiority, of arrogance. We did it. Uh, you helped a little, but, you know, really, we did it. In 1946, the Americans ended the nuclear partnership with Britain. Senator Brian McMahon's legislation made it a capital offense to reveal nuclear secrets, even to their former allies. It was a devastating rebuff for the new government of Prime Minister Clement Attlee. Well, it was a terrific blow, and Attlee did everything he could to try and get the thing back on track. That October, in a secret cabinet committee, 
Attlee listened to his colleagues argue over Britain's bomb. There is an enormous anxiety, I think, in the political class uh, in, in Britain at this particular time um, that in order to retain our position for as long as we possibly can, then uh, we have to develop these weapons uh, ourselves. Two ministers, Stafford Cripps and Hugh Dalton, were close to persuading Attlee that Britain could not compete with the Americans. But then the Foreign Secretary, Ernest Bevan, arrived, still bristling over a conversation he'd had with the American Secretary of State. Bevin turned up and said, no, Prime Minister, that won't do at all. We've got to have this. And uh, one of the reasons he gave was a very striking one, uh, quite bluntly. He said, I don't mind for myself, but I don't want any other foreign secretary of this country to be talked at by a secretary of state in the United States, as I have just had. We've got to have this thing over here, whatever it costs and we've got to have a bloody Union Jack flying on top of it. Attlee was persuaded. Britain must have its own bomb. Not just for deterrence, but, he believed, to persuade America that Britain was its natural nuclear ally. If you're in a nuclear relationship with them, it's a bond. It sets you apart from all the other countries in the world. You're the, 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 the family member. And that's terribly important to Britain as a, as a, as a world uh, power in decline. Attlee turned to the one man he knew was capable of building a bomb. He'd worked closely with the Americans at Los Alamos and helped design the bombs that would be dropped on Japan. His name was William Penny. Look out in the background. The thing we particularly would like to know is how you personally feel about the work that you do. Well, I think it's got to be done. Penny was a most interesting guy. He came from very ordinary beginnings. He was self-made, and he had a funny little drawl. And he looked and spoke as though he was a bit simple, quite honestly, because he had a brain like a razor. A brilliant mathematician, and we were so lucky to have him. And what are your plans now, sir? Well, I have to send in my report to the government. When I've done that, I shall have a short holiday and I hope to play some golf. Yes, King Golf? Yes, King Golf. And thank you very much for talking to us. Penny faced a choice. Return to quiet academia or agree to Attlee's request to build Britain's first atom bomb. He had a, a, a wonderful offer of being principal, I think, of an Oxford college but I think the politicians persuaded my father that Britain should have a nuclear deterrent and he was persuaded that it was his duty to take on this awful job, really. Penny's nuclear achievements had been made in collaboration with American scientists, but now he was on his own. If we were going to do it, we had to repeat work which they'd already done, because not published, uh, at enormous cost. And of course, it cost us a lot in time. We were way behind the Americans in producing atomic weapons. But Attlee had faith in his scientists. British science is extraordinary. We'd invented radar, we were, we'd split the atom, we invented the jet engine, uh, we had an extraordinary impact. I mean, considering the size of, of the British scientific community compared to uh, the American scientific community, um, the flourishing that taken place in World War II and subsequently was remarkable. Penny could at least rely on John Cockcroft, one of the pioneers of nuclear science. We have all the same problems. Cockcroft was appointed to run Harwell, the new atomic research establishment charged with reproducing the nuclear science the Americans already had. With Cockcroft at Harwell, Penny could set up Aldermaston, where the bomb would be made. That left the most difficult task creating the vital ingredient for the bomb, plutonium. It meant building Britain's first nuclear reactor. 
It was a huge task, and it went to Britain's best engineer, Christopher Hinton. Hinton was enormously impressive. You were aware when he came into the room that here was a very, very imposing person. He was uh, well over six feet, six foot two or three, a very keen face and piercing blue eyes. And he was very much the leader, the boss, the planner, the chap who knew what to do. They were nicknamed the Bold Bad Barons. Penny, Cockcroft and Hinton would mastermind Britain's atomic project. They were arch meritocrats. They certainly had no element of privilege in their background. Um, and uh, there was a lot of that about in the post-war years. I think they would have conformed to what C.P. Snow called uh, the new men, the, 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 this ideal of, of uh, uh, people who make their own way and contribute on the basis of their, of their talents um, without class paying a part. And so it was that Windscale, a small peninsula of land next door to the town of Seascale, became the home to Britain's first nuclear reactor. The area had enjoyed brief popularity as a Victorian seaside resort, but by the late 1940s, its main industry was in decline. Well, as with all mining areas, there's been a history of major accidents, and one of the major pit losses here was 104 people killed. It had also been a very depressed area before the war. It suffered massively during the Depression. And so it was an area where people, uh, even though they may have had some questions in the back of their minds, certainly would have seen this as a, as a bright new future and gone into a very clean and infinitely much safer industry. And so that's why so many people welcomed it. To build Windscale, Hinton needed the cutting-edge nuclear science to come from Harwell. To Harwell come students from all parts of the Commonwealth and the British Isles to learn something of the power plants of the atomic age. The challenge the researchers at Harwell faced was to design a reactor at Windscale which would produce enough plutonium for the bomb. When pieces of uranium are brought together, a chain reaction occurs. Neutrons released by the uranium collide with neutrons from its neighbors, releasing even more neutrons. This chain reaction converts some of the uranium into plutonium. But the chain reaction makes uranium ferociously hot. Left unchecked, the reaction could go out of control, like a bomb. The British scientists knew the Americans controlled the chain reaction by placing the uranium in hundreds of channels, drilled through a block of pure graphite, known as the core. The uranium becomes dangerously hot, so to prevent it from catching fire, the uranium was placed in aluminium cartridges which sealed it off from the air. Once the plutonium had been produced, the hot cartridges were then pushed out of the back of the core into cooling ponds of water, so the precious plutonium could be extracted. But the most dangerous part of the process was while the cartridges were still inside the graphite core. Unless they were constantly cooled, they could melt the core or set it on fire. The British knew that the Americans had prevented this in their reactor at Hanford, by pouring a constant stream of water through the channels. But this system had a serious weakness. If the water supply failed, the core itself could explode. The reactor would run very rapidly, and I mean very rapidly, within a second or so, out of control. At Hanford in North America, there was a special 30-mile-long escape road built as part of the safety precautions. And we decided this country was far too small to have a reactor with such dangerous possibilities built anywhere, uh, not even in Scotland. But the British scientists believed they'd found the answer. To cool the huge reactor, batteries of fans drive air through a ventilating system around it. Windscale's graphite core would be cooled not with water, but with air, blown through the core by huge fans and taking the heat up and out through enormous chimneys. 
it convinced them that it would be safe to build a reactor next to sea scale. And work continued on Britain's most ambitious engineering project. But the reactor was not being built as Christopher Hinton wanted. He faced a deadline imposed on him by politicians. They demanded that Britain should be a nuclear power by 1952, the same year the Soviet Union was expected to have the bomb. For such new and untried science, it was a horrendous deadline to meet. The development work that should have been done at Harwell was all cut short by the extreme political and military pressure on them, the, the very, very tight deadlines that were given. With time so short, building had begun before the research work was complete. A year into construction, a scientist at Harwell made a devastating discovery. Construction was well on the way, and the air was going to be discharged up at chimneys, 400 feet high. I think in the early summer of uh, 1948, uh, I doodled uh, on a piece of paper about asking myself what would happen if one uranium uh, rod were to catch fire. Mm -hmm. And um, I didn't want much like the answer. Price realized that if an aluminium mm. cartridge burst, the uranium could burn and the powerful air cooling system would blow radioactive dust up the chimney. There was nothing to stop radioactivity blowing out over sea scale and beyond. So I went to the next committee uh, meeting and said that I think that it would be desirable to filter the air coming out of the chimney. Uh, and it went down like an absolute lead balloon. The chairman leant back in the chair and said, don't be so silly, lad. Two tons of air go up chimney every second, can't filter that. And it was considered such a fatuous remark that it didn't, doesn't even appear in the minutes of the meeting. Many thought filters would be an unnecessary delay. But John Cockcroft backed Price and ordered massive concrete filters to be winched 400 feet and attached to the top of the chimneys. That is why the filters are known as Cockcroft's Follies. At least they were. Uh, the word folly did not seem appropriate after the accident. It was a warning for Hinton. In Whitehall, meeting the deadline for the bomb was more important than the safety of the reactor. Hinton never took any chances with safety because of this pressure, uh, but he was really having to work almost hand, from hand to mouth. But the shortcuts taken with safety would later haunt the man who built Windscale. In 1951, after five years of backbreaking work, Windscale was built just ten days behind schedule. This is the Windscale reactor, hung about with ladders like Gulliver in Lilliput. Hinton had achieved what many had thought was impossible in such a short time. Windscale is unique. It is science fiction intruding on our sober lives. And it is a very great producer of plutonium. It was true, Windscale could produce plutonium, just not enough for the bomb. It was at the research laboratory at Harwell that scientists realized that the uranium cartridges weren't producing enough plutonium. The only way for Windscale to increase plutonium output was to heat the uranium even more. And the only way to do that was to reduce the amount of aluminium casing around the uranium. The problem was, that the cartridges had been manufactured and were already inside the reactor. Then Windscale's deputy general manager, Tom Tui, came up with an answer. Tom Tui was a most impressive character. He was pretty young for his senior post. He uh, 
largely ran it, I think, and he was extremely dominant. He got a finger on every part of the of the site and was very full of energy. Uh, he was a lively, handsome man, sort of bold features and a mass of gorgeous auburn hair flowing back from his forehead. Tui simply took the cartridges out and trimmed off some of the aluminium, the fins. And this meant unloading the 102 tons, clipping one sixth of an inch of aluminium off every fin, of which there were 14 on each of 36,000 fuel elements, which meant we had to do about a half a million fins. And one of our engineers devised a, a, a little machine whereby you could place this on a rack and turn it round and you made a stroke like that, clipped your fin, turned it round, clipped another, turned it round, clipped another, and we managed to get the whole half million fins off, as I say, in, in three weeks. It was a classic case of British make, do and mend, but it meant one of Windscale's safety features had been removed. Opinion at the reactor was split. Well, there were two schools of thought. They were proud of the fact that they were producing plutonium at, uh, at whatever, at the faster rate maybe, as, or, or meeting the targets that had been set for them and so on and so on, and they were doing it in the, in definitely as they saw it, there was, a, there was a national interest. Gung ho queen and country stuff, you know. There was another very significant group who were extremely concerned about the attitude towards the um, possible dangers from radiation and so on and so on. The warnings were ignored. Nothing was allowed to delay the production of plutonium. And in August 1952, the first plutonium left Windscale to become part of Britain's atom bomb. I broke down the reaction vessel myself personally, opened it up, scrambled around amongst calcium fluoride to see if I could find anything. And there I found a piece of plutonium about this size, but the size of a 50 pence piece. 132 grams, and that was our very first piece. So all this vast industrial complex and six years of activity came down to 132 grams of plutonium. Hinton had done his job. Now it was the turn of William Penny. Seven years after helping the Americans build their bomb, Penny gathered his team for the crucial bomb test in Australia. The pressure was on Penny. Britain had a new Prime Minister, the man who had invented the phrase special relationship. Churchill was determined that Penny's atom bomb would restore Britain's standing with the Americans. Never! shall we lose our faith and courage and never shall we fail in exertion and resolve. And the word went round that on their permanent secretary's desk in the Minister of Supply, there were two forms. Uh, and one said, hard luck, Dr. Penny. The other said, congratulations, Sir William. <laughs> now to key turning the circuit into position to fire. Minus one and a half minutes. Five, four, three, two, one. Now. above Montebello marks the achievement of British science and industry in the development of atomic power. But it leaves unanswered the question, how shall this newfound power be used? The answer doesn't lie with Britain alone, but we may have a greater voice in this great decision if we have the strength to defend ourselves and to deter aggression. The bomb worked. It was a triumph, not just for Penny, but also for Windscale. Mm. 
Britain's bomb maker, now Sir William Penny, came home to a hero's welcome. Can you, sir, at this stage tell us anything at all about Montebello? No, not at all. Closed book at the moment. Yes, completely. And have you anything else to say for us? <laughs> the achievement of this group of people is inspiring. It was a, a case of brain power and ability and will triumphing over um, meagre resources and uh, an austere climate and all sorts of political difficulties. Um, I would defy anybody to follow the, uh, the career of, of Bill Penny through this period or of, of, of Christopher Hinton and not feel uplifted by what they did in the teeth of all sorts of difficulties. Armed with the atom bomb, Churchill was sure he could persuade the Americans to re-establish the special relationship and Britain's place at the top table. But within weeks of Britain's triumph, Churchill learned that the Americans were in the Pacific with a new weapon. The blast will come out of the horizon just about there. And this is the significance of the moment. This is the first full-scale test of a hydrogen device. If the reaction goes, we're in the thermonuclear era. For the sake of all of us, and for the sake of our country, I know that you join me in wishing this expedition well. It is now 30 seconds to zero time. Put on goggles or turn away. Do not remove goggles or face burst until 10 seconds after the first light. It was a shock. The trump card had been trumped, as it were, which wasn't supposed to happen. America's hydrogen bomb could deliver a blast of a megaton, ten times the size of the British bomb. I think that they realized very quickly then that Britain couldn't actually compete uh, with the United States and probably couldn't compete with the Soviet Union ultimately. In Congress, leading senators spoke out against sharing their new nuclear secrets with Britain. President Eisenhower has not proposed, and I'm sure the Congress would not be willing. I don't know if even our allies would ask that information be given to them with respect to the me mechanics of the weapon, how it is made, how it is put together. That is too vital to our own national security to be disclosed to anybody. An American senator said that a partnership with Britain would be like trading a horse for a rabbit. But Churchill would not abandon his desire to see Britain and America as nuclear partners. Secretly, he ordered Penny to develop the hydrogen bomb. In a sense, that made the stakes higher for, for, for um, uh, developing a hydrogen bomb. This was something they had to do. This was one thing they could do. They had to do it. The pressure was on. And um, uh, maybe if they could do that, uh, they would uh, rebuild this partnership with the, with the Americans. It was a decision that would set Windscale on the path to nuclear disaster. Building an H-bomb would require not just more plutonium, but a new material called tritium. But Windscale had only been designed to make plutonium. And the reactor had begun behaving unpredictably. Unknown uh, to the operators, uh, a, a process was building up whereby the, uh, the material, the main material of the reactor, uh, was beginning to be different from, from an ordinary construction material. It was the graphite core that was causing alarm. 
its temperature would suddenly increase dramatically. The Windscale men, concerned that the core could catch fire, switched on the fans and blew the graphite cool. The radiation had caused the graphite to store up energy. At any moment, it could be released as heat and potentially start a fire. So the scientists invented a procedure to control the release of stored energy, called a Wigner release. By heating the reactor to much higher temperatures, the stored energy would be released gradually and the danger averted. We were told that the graphite grew and by running it at a higher temperature for so long, you release the energy in the graphite and it returned back to normal, which is... Uh, that, that was kind of a learning curve, all this. In fact, everybody was on a learning curve there, really, from, you know, ground floor to, to top level. Although the scientists were still on the learning curve, Churchill now publicly committed Britain to the hydrogen bomb. We have seen what the effects of an airburst atomic bomb heat, radiation and blast might do to a typical British city. Let us now apply these effects to the population of that city. These people are all killed. In theory, they have died three times over. The public began to grow anxious about what the scientists were doing. One of the sad things is you get this phrase, or used to in those days, the mad scientists. And uh, the public had the idea of scientists, you know, my God, they're going to end the world, they're going to blow it up. And so it was never like that, really. It was never like that. But there were great pressures on the scientists to go faster than they would have liked to have done. We appeal as human beings to human beings. Remember your humanity and forget the rest. If you can do so, the way lies open to you paradise. If you cannot, there lies before you the risk of universal death. 17th of October, 1956. A new reactor, Calder Hall, opened just yards from Windscale. This was the public face of nuclear science, which would, politicians hoped, answer the growing concern about the work of the nuclear scientists. Today, scientists, engineers and statesmen from 40 different countries... Have... It was worthy of a royal unveiling. Calder Hall was the first nuclear power station in the world. The public were promised electricity that would be too cheap to meter. Anyhow, that's how I feel. Wow, I feel just like a Pollyanna. It is with pride that I now open Calder Hall, Britain's first atomic power station. As the Queen sent electricity into the national grid, what the watching public didn't know was the new reactor hadn't been built just to make electricity. I believe there were times when it was taking electricity out of the grid rather than pumping it in. It's always been a cover to some extent for plutonium production. It took the edge off the destructive aspects of the bomb, which the government regards as good propaganda. We, we're doing this because it's going gonna, it's gonna to be positively good for the people. I'm not going to blow them all up. We're going to get some electricity out of it. Secretly, Calder Hall was helping Windscale produce more of the material it needed to meet the demands of the bomb program. Britain has got to make its mark, and the way to make its mark was not to build a nuclear power station, but to let an H bomb set. As the world fated Calder Hall, Windscale was creaking under the new demands for the H-bomb. The more modern Calder Hall was a closed system and couldn't blow radioactivity into the atmosphere. But readings taken around Windscale had produced alarming results. Frank Leslie, a Windscale research scientist, discovered high levels of radioactivity around Seascale. 
some of the radioactive cartridges had got stuck. They'd become lodged in the back of the reactor, bursting open. The famous filters, Cockroft's Follies, had failed to prevent the radioactive dust being blown out over Cumbria. But Leslie's warnings were kept quiet. Though it was known at the highest political level, somebody up there also said it was to be kept secret. And that had very unfortunate repercussions because, again for reasons I don't know, people in the research laboratories uh, at Winscale were not allowed to know about it. Then Britain's H-bomb project was hit by a new deadline. World leaders had met in Geneva to sign up to a ban on nuclear bomb testing by 1958. Churchill knew that Britain was running out of time. It had to be hurried because of the um, nuclear test ban treaty. So there was that rather narrow moment of uh, opportunity between us actually hitting the ground, not running very fast, in fact, barely walking, and, um, and, and the moment when it would come into force. There could be no delays at Windscale. The leaking cartridges were dealt with by more make do and mend. People such as myself, ready in the bottom of the chimney, would go along the duct with um, a sort of shovel and push them back into the water duct um, so that there was no chance they would lie there and oxidise. So that helped to reduce the, the problem. Vic Goodwin was a 20-year-old physics graduate who'd just arrived at Windscale. Looking rather like a super version of a plastic Macintosh is a new suit designed for workers at Britain's atomic plants. New recruits did get that kind of job. One wore a kind of polythene suit. I think one had an airline. Once you're inside and the zip's been fastened, all that remains is to pump in compressed air so that the wearer can breathe easily. One certainly had a, a rope round one's waist and a minder. That was a very reliable man who would make sure that you didn't spend uh, too long or fall over into the canal. It wasn't just unpleasant work, it was dangerous. You had to strip off as soon as you got there and put factory clothing on. And then on the way home, you all had to shower and then you could go right through and then collect your clothes at the other end and come back in the clothes you went in. But you never wore um, your outdoor clothes on the factory, completely from head to, head to toe. They were mm. even vests and underpants and socks and, socks, and shoes. Oh, he got scrubbed in the showers and he came home with bandages on. The radiators and doses that we're allowed to take then was much higher than it is today. In fact, I think if uh, we took the same kind of dosages today, there'd be questions asked in the Houses of Parliament. But, uh, that was life then, you know. But with a test ban looming, the politicians couldn't afford any more delays. Unless we do this very quickly, unless we achieve uh, this uh, research breakthrough in hydrogen weapons, then there will be a moratorium. There will be uh, an end of, of fissile production. Uh, there will be a, a disarmament program, which the Americans and the Russians had signed up to, and we would be left behind. If the test failed, it could spell the end of British hopes for nuclear collaboration with America. So we had to go straight from the design principles to engineering it, to putting it in a bomber. It was vital that Windscale make the deadline and deliver Penny the new material, tritium. It was a mountain for Windscale to climb. America's Atomic Energy Commission devoted huge resources to this task. The Atomic Energy Commission controlled more assets and capital investment and scale of factories and so forth than the sixth largest United States corporations combined, used something like one-tenth of all the electricity in the United States, and so on and so on. It was a truly monumental effort to make these very small amounts of material with these extraordinary properties. 
and wind scale was venturing into unknown scientific territory. New cartridges were designed containing enriched uranium and lithium magnesium, which could catch fire at high temperatures. Some of the senior scientists sounded the alarm. They were putting things in which uh, didn't look very nice from a safety point of view. The pressure was such that, and people accepted pressures then, if a production target had to be met, it was rather like wartime, you met it. They were running much too near the precipice. But the warning signs couldn't have come at a worse time for the government. Britain's failed attempt to win back control of the Suez Canal had been a national humiliation. The American President Eisenhower had refused to back the British action. Suez is, is undoubtedly the lowest point uh, in the post-war special relationship uh, with the United States. Um, the United States um, it, it effectively causes uh, the withdrawal of, of Britain um, from uh, the Suez operation itself. Britain's new Prime Minister, Harold Macmillan, was not prepared to accept that the debacle in Suez was proof that Britain was no longer a great power. Every now and again since the war, I've heard people say, isn't Britain only a second or third class power now? Isn't she on the way out? What nonsense. This is a great country, so don't let's be ashamed to say so. Macmillan was convinced he could deliver what he called the great prize because of his friendship with the American president. And they'd had a very close wartime relationship in North Africa. Uh, they'd remained friends uh, during the post-war period. They knew each other very well. They trusted each other. In March 1957, Macmillan met Eisenhower in Bermuda. He felt, I think, that his relationship with uh, Eisenhower was so close, the trust was so great, uh, that he could deliver what no other British Prime Minister had been able to deliver. Macmillan urged his friend to convince Congress to share their nuclear secrets. But he knew that Britain would have to prove it was America's nuclear equal. America's H-bomb had produced a blast of a megaton, ten times the size of Britain's atom bomb. Britain's H-bomb needed to be a megaton. Somewhere along the line, the magic megaton had been mentioned. A vast military force gathered in the Pacific for the H-bomb tests. The stakes for Penny had never been higher. The tests in May and June 1957 um, are politically very important indeed because there's this pressure for a moratorium uh, on, on nuclear testing. The politicians really see an opportunity during this period to influence the Americans. Windscale had met its target delivering the tritium for the bomb. And so developing a weapon system um, which um, appeared to have um, a, a megaton yield was very important politically in this campaign of trying to reopen a collaboration with the, with the United States. But would Penny's H-bomb produce the magic megaton? was an embarrassing failure. The blast was nowhere near a megaton. It was barely bigger than the atom bomb of five years earlier. But Penny had a backup plan, another bomb. It was called Orange Herald. I thought Orange Herald was a stupid device. It wasn't elegant. Uh, it, it couldn't be developed any further, a dead-end design, um, and it consumed an enormous amount of very expensive fissile material. It's not what I would have recommended, but I wasn't in charge. It wasn't an H-bomb at all, just a massive atom bomb they were convinced would produce a megaton. It needed huge quantities of plutonium and the magic ingredient, tritium. If you hoped to get a lot of big bangs, you need a lot of tritium. Uh, it was as simple as that. And so the demand for tritium on places like wind scale went up considerably. 
As the Orange Herald test approached, Windscale was suddenly ordered to increase production of the new material, tritium, by 500%. Five years before, the scientists had increased production for the atom bomb by removing some of the aluminium cartridge. To try to meet the demands for the H-bomb, new aluminium cartridges had been made to house the uranium and lithium magnesium. And once again, some of the aluminium casing was then removed to boost production by increasing the heat of the reaction. They also doubled the amount of lithium magnesium in the cartridges. But some expressed alarm at the danger of a nuclear accident. I would have said it was a reasonably green situation until the end of 55. I would have said it was orange in 56 and red from January the 1st, 57. It had put Windscale under even greater strain. But Orange Herald was ready for the watching media. When the flash comes, you see it round you, although you can't look at it. It's sort of every rivet on the ship sort of lights up, every bit of metal. And then after that, quite a long time after, you get the blast. So you see the thing very immediately. But you, you think, oh, well, it's all over, and suddenly you're hit by the blast. And it's very impressive. The government didn't tell the media Orange Herald wasn't an H-bomb. There was confusion, and politicians fudged things by talking sometimes about an H-bomb and sometimes about a megaton. Macmillan's spin worked. The press reported that Britain had produced a megaton H-bomb. They'd hoped for a megaton, they got 800,000 kilotons, but it was still a colossal blast. There's a lot of press coverage um, of, of those tests, which um, suggest that Britain has developed uh, an H-bomb. There is no desire to put the record straight um, at this particular time, for largely political reasons. But the Americans weren't deceived into thinking Britain was now their equal. The scientists were trying to deliver. Um, they were disappointed uh, in the results. And so I think there must have been enormous anxiety in Whitehall at this time that maybe, given the pressures, um, we wouldn't be in a position quickly uh, to renew the collaboration, which was the great prize as far as Macmillan was concerned. Macmillan was undaunted. He ordered Penny to prepare another H-bomb test. But Windscale had already reached breaking point. The problem is that there was nobody to say no. Weeks after Orange Herald, Christopher Hinton, the man who led Windscale through so much, dramatically left. He was utterly upset towards the end of his stay with what had happened, and he sort of had a semi-nervous breakdown. Windscale had lost its bold, bad baron, just as the scientists were warning of impending disaster. But Macmillan's attention was elsewhere. A bolt from a clear blue Soviet sky. The Russians launched Sputnik, the world's first satellite. Suddenly, America was vulnerable to a Soviet attack. There was as much shock and fear uh, about Sputnik as the United States felt with 9-11. It was such a precision strike. I said we should have been the first ones to have it, if there's such thing. It gets the American people alarmed that a foreign country, especially an enemy country, can do this, and it, we fear this. One small satellite orbiting the Earth, and yet a profound convulsion in American society as a result. Macmillan seized his chance. On the night of October the 10th, 1957, he wrote to Eisenhower, urging him to force Congress to accept Britain as America's nuclear ally. 
But even as he wrote, 300 miles north, events were unfolding which could steal the great prize, just as it was in his grasp. If you're a fatalist or believe um, like the Greeks in the malign influence of the gods, uh, you could point at that week and say, it really was extraordinary that the very evening that my grandfather wrote to Ike, my dear friend, saying all the plans that he had, that very evening, the fire started at Winscale. Three days earlier, Vic Goodwin had turned up for his shift at the Winscale control room. The men monitoring the temperature gauges on the control panel had noticed that the reactor was heating up, more than it should. They ordered a Vigna release. This was the process they had come up with a few years earlier. Heating the graphite core had the effect of releasing any dangerous stored energy in the core. Once the energy was released, the graphite would eventually cool down. They'd done Vigna releases before, eight times. If the Vigna release worked, Goodwin would see the temperature rising all across the core, showing the stored energy was being released. Instead, the temperatures were falling when they should have been rising. The Vigna release hadn't removed the stored energy, except in one channel, 2053, which did appear to be releasing its stored energy. Unlike the rest, its temperature was rising. By early Tuesday morning, they faced a choice. Leaving the stored energy in the reactor wrist to fire, heating the reactor further, a second Vigna release, would raise the temperature of the core even higher. The experienced people decided that it would be necessary to warm it up again which had been done in the past. The second heating worked. The temperatures rose in all the channels, including 2053. The stored energy was being released. Now they had to make sure the temperatures didn't rise above the maximum allowed. As the temperatures rose, and on some thermocouples they were approaching 400 degrees centigrade, we allowed more air to flow through the core in order to control the temperatures. Windscale's air cooling system was turned on to cool the graphite core still further. But by Thursday morning, it was clear the reactor was behaving unpredictably. I was rather puzzled because some areas that of the core, which had been cooling, um, on Wednesday, we're now heating up again. Goodwin checked the radiation levels coming out of the chimney. They were high. High enough for him to believe a rogue uranium cartridge was the cause of the problem. In my opinion, uh, we'd got a, a badly burst uh, cartridge, fuel element, uranium fuel element. As serious as a burst cartridge was, the team had faced that situation before. The problem was, it wasn't a burst cartridge. It was a fire inside channel 2053. The cartridges, which had been redesigned to increase tritium output, had caught fire. The decision the year before to reduce the aluminium in the cartridges meant they could burn more easily. The extra heating for the Vigna release had caused them to burst and catch fire. The accident the scientists had feared had finally happened. But the men at Windscale didn't know that. They still thought it was just a burst cartridge that needed removing. They decided to cool down the graphite core and turned on the fans to blow it cold. It was a fateful decision. It's like putting a match to a piece of paper. The fire will spread along the material. 
In trying to cool the core, they had fanned the flames of the fire, causing it to spread throughout hundreds of channels. The fire was soon burning out of control. Radioactivity pouring out of the chimney. The activity in the chimney went up a lot. And it became obvious that something was really adrift. Outside, arriving for work, Eddie Davis could already see signs of the fire. I was walking down the road towards the pile and looked up at the chimney um, because we were responsible for the filters on the chimney and saw this smoke coming out of the chimney. In the control room, all eyes were on the temperature gauges. I came down and went into the control room again and by then quite a lot of people had gathered in there. One of my colleagues came across just reading out graphite temperatures which were going up. So, you know, this was clearly um, dreadful. The men knew this couldn't be a burst cartridge. It could only mean the reactor was on fire. So then I walked up onto the top of the pile and uh, I saw a monitor up there. And he said, don't go in the precipitator house because it's too hot. There's too much radiation there. There was no emergency plan for dealing with a fire. The men were on their own. He just said there'd been an incident. And I said, incident? He said, yes, I can't talk about it, love. I, I won't be coming home. Uh, I'll let you know as time goes on. Everybody was very subdued. And of course, nobody knew what was going to happen or how to treat it. The longer they did nothing, the more the fire would burn, and the more the radioactivity would pour out onto sea scale. If we carried on as we were, um, th there was the risk that the whole lot would burn and go up the chimney. No official warning was given. People in sea scale went about as normal. John was my baby and he was in a pram on the front lawn in the sunshine. And he, he rang up and said, get John in. And I said, why? Well, I said, just get him inside. Close all the windows, close all the doors. Don't go out and lock the hens up. I won't be home tonight. And that was it. One man had been missing from the emergency at Windscale, Tom Tui. I was at home when this happened. And I got a phone call from the general manager uh, and we had a very brief conversation. He said, Tom, pile one's on fire. I said, good God, you don't mean the call? He said, yes, can you come in? I said, yes. I got in my car and went straight to the pile. I could climb up 80 feet into the air, no lift, with a respirator on my face and a bottle of air on my back to look down holes at the back of the reactor. There were four inspection holes at the back and um, you could look down those and see what was happening. Well, I looked down onto a blazing inferno. And it went through my mind that if the temperature exceeded 600 degrees centigrade, the floor on which I was standing could collapse. I thought, what a bloody mess we're in. I mean, literally, that's the, that's the thought that went through my mind. Word started to get out in sea scale. I, I do believe that Calder Girls' School closed because of the, um, not immediately, because of the um, parents' worries about their children, of course, and I think some parents did come and take their children away immediately. Next thing was my daughter came flying in, Mummy, Mummy, what's happening? I said, I don't know, Pet. What are you, why are you here? She said, well, we've all been sent home. She said, where's Daddy? I said, is at work? He said, is, she, is he coming home? I said, he won't be coming home today. Why? I said, I don't know, Pet. Half 
half the village vanished. Uh, the, a lot of the, the, the fathers of, of children and the husbands of, of wives must have been able to get through or some, but they immediately said, get out, get out, go to, go to your mothers, go to your aunties, go, go, just go. And, and within overnight, there was only half of us here. I wasn't going to move as long as, long as my husband was there, I was going to stop here. This was a blazing inferno, and we knew it was pushing radioactive fission product waste up the chimney all the time, and uh, we, we didn't know what we could do to stop it in the first place. The decision was taken, I, I'm sure it was the right thing to do, um, to try to get shot of as much fuel from the core as possible. The men began an operation to try to remove the burning cartridges from the core. We were trying to, to push the burning fuel through uh, into the back of the reactor. But the heat had melted the cartridges, so they'd become stuck inside the core. They were forced to use scaffolding poles they'd found nearby to try and push the cartridges out. Radiation was so intense they could only work a few hours. They were running out of firefighters. The police uh, from the factory had turned up looking for volunteers. Uh, and they brought a bus and they decided the best way to get the volunteers was to go to the cinema and, uh, and volunteer the back two rows uh, at, the, uh, at the show to go into the factory to uh, as it turned out, to uh, help push the fuel rods out of the, uh, out of the reactor. Still on top of the reactor, one man ignored the radiation warnings. I decided that I didn't want somebody tapping me on the back and say, hey, you know, had too much. I knew I had to be there until the damn thing was dealt with. With no sign of the fire dying out, Tui began to think the unthinkable. It was I eventually who phoned the general manager's office and said, look, uh, I want to use water. If they tried to put the fire out with water, the consequences could be catastrophic. You didn't have to know the details about some steam coming out of some place or other to realize the potentiality for disaster. And it's a control bomb, really nuclear power, a sort of control bomb. Mankind had not faced anything like this ever before. <laughs> There's no way to give you any advice. You play it by ear. I was near him at the time and he said, and you see that everybody in the area is undercover around here, which I did. We'd had Rishima, we'd had uh, all these places where bombs were dropped and places. And I thought, we're only about two miles away. If it goes up, we will all go with it. And I said, OK. Tui gave the signal for the water to be turned on. The pressure was too high, so I had the pressure reduced so at least the water was then sinking down through the channels into the fire itself. There was no explosion. But the water wasn't putting out the fire. Tui had one last hope. You had to keep the air on as long as you had men on the charge hoist. Huh? And of course, the worst thing you can possibly do is to be feeding a massive fire with air. So I phoned up uh, the general manager, Davy, and said this water's having no effect, but I propose to shut the air off. 
If turning the air off didn't work, they had no means of putting out the fire. You've got this blazing inferno with these flames belting out and hitting the back wall. Air goes off and <laughs> just like that. Absolutely incredible. fire was out. The people of Windscale were saved. To see that you've licked it, huh? with, with the fire disappearing like that, that was a marvellous feeling. Probably everybody in the reactor building would have been killed. A lot of people on the site would have probably have been killed. The neighbourhood would have been heavily contaminated and the land would probably not be in use to this day. I was so pleased to see him home because I, had, I honestly didn't think I was going to do it. But even thinking about it upsets me because I have never been so frightened in my whole life. The Atomic Energy Authority have announced that some uranium cartridges in the center of the atomic pilot wind scale became overheated yesterday. The authority have said that staff are now reducing the temperature of the pile with water. At the moment, a northeast wind is blowing across the wind scale factory and is taking any radioactive dust or vapor out to sea. In fact, it had been turning the air off, not the water, which had put out the fire and many believed the wind was blowing the radioactivity inland. Well, my impression was that it was blowing a bit eastward, uh, which would probably be heading more towards Scofell, you know, at, the, at that particular time. The immediate concern appeared to be contaminated milk and the risk that babies could develop thyroid cancer. The government ordered all the milk produced for miles around to be poured away. Emergency at Windscale Atom Plant, and the milk from 200 square miles of farmland is condemned as radioactive. But for these filter tops, once nicknamed Cockroft's Folly because Sir John Cockroft insisted on them, farms much farther away would have faced not emergency but disaster. The farmers carry on as usual, for cows have to be milked, whatever happens to the milk afterwards. You can't explain radioactivity to a cow. Yes, well, I mean, they had to demonstrate how concerned they were. Wonderful public relations. Oh, they are concerned, the wonderful crowd. Now the worst seems to be over. Though Mr. Stan Ritson, who helped to bring Windscale's overheated reactor under control, was radioactive for four days and couldn't even kiss his wife till the Geiger counters gave permission. The press hailed the Windscale men as heroes. But within days, the men who had fought the fire would be fighting to clear their names, as Windscale became part of a political cover-up. For Macmillan, the fire at Windscale was a major embarrassment. He was only days away from a meeting where President Eisenhower would announce that Britain was fit to be America's nuclear ally. Macmillan ordered a closed inquiry under Sir William Penny, the man who had led Britain's bomb project. Six days after putting out the fire, the Windscale men were called in, one by one, to account for their actions. The evidence they gave was deemed so sensitive that only now, for the first time, can the tapes be heard. In a room just yards from where the fire had raged, Sir William Penny opened proceedings. To investigate into the cause of the accident at Windscale and the measures taken to deal with it, and its consequences. Now, before we start, would you be good enough to say what your job is? The impression that I've retained is going into a room and seeing this very large man. Penny was a big man, but uh, extremely pleasant, courteous and uh, thoughtful and uh, very polite indeed. If you wish to smoke, please do. For nine days, they gave their evidence. They were truly exhausted and they were all worried to death 
and both for themselves and for the plant. And you know, it's been a dreadful experience for them, and you can hear it in, their, in the voices of many of them. At first, they said if it went over 1,200, oh, God help us. And when it kept on creeping up, it, it was quite frightening just not to know what might happen. I was called in, and I remember they wrote up on the blackboard a list of things that they wanted to know. Things had had to be investigated pronto, quick. As the evidence mounted, the role of the new cartridges introduced for the H-bomb became central. Now, is the question, sir, uh, anything Mr. Rotherham can tell us about isotope cartridges? Yes, <laughs> because they're dangerous. <laughs> Various different things are being cooked up in the reactor, not just uranium, you see, uh, because they were also making material for tritium, for the, for, the, for the thermonuclear bomb, the hydrogen bomb as well, in there. But the tritium certainly was a critical one. Some of the men told Penny that they believed the new lithium-magnesium cartridges had started the fire. The analysis does, in fact, give a very clear indication of what the sequence of events was. What is the sequence? You can get... The AM cartridge, which will, if it's perforated, it will burn. If it burns, the temperature in the channel will rise seven or eight hundred degrees centigrade. And again, I would have thought the graphite and the palm might very well burn under those conditions. Yes. Oh, thank you very much. I can see no further questions that we want to ask you. Penny began to focus on another possible cause. He asked if the decision to have a second nuclear heating or Vigna release had been a mistake. You did say that you couldn't quite remember whether it was you or not that put on the second nuclear heating. Do you reckon that was the right decision anyhow? Yes. We, we've done this reheating several times before. With no series of effect. Thank you. The men were adamant that they hadn't caused the fire. They'd followed the tried and tested procedure. As Penny was conducting his inquiry, Macmillan travelled to Washington to claim his great prize. The one result of the Washington talks is that Britain and America will cooperate more closely in nuclear science. It was a historic moment which would redefine the relationship between their two nations. Macmillan and Eisenhower declared that Britain and America would now be nuclear partners. My grandfather was absolutely over the moon. When they went back to the embassy, they did crack open a bottle of champagne to celebrate. But when Macmillan returned to Britain, Penny's report was on his desk. It showed that the political demand for a megaton bomb had fueled the fire at Windscale. You can imagine the sort of bottom dropping out of Macmillan's stomach saying, is this, some, is this another disaster that's going to rob us of this great prize, as he called it, of, of American cooperation? The Windscale fire threatened to wreck everything he and his predecessors had been striving for. That night, he wrote, how are we to deal with Sir William Penny's report? To publish it to the world, especially the Americans, might put in jeopardy our chance of getting Congress to agree to the President's proposal. Macmillan ordered that all copies of the Penny Report be recalled. They didn't want to look like a bunch of amateurs. And uh, the Windscale fire certainly threatened to do that. This was the first really big nuclear accident. But Windscale wouldn't just disappear. Frank Leslie, who two years before had discovered radiation leaks, this time went to the press. He told them the fire had caused another leak. He was by no means unrepresentative. There were, there was, there were plenty of people who also felt like him, that uh, really um, the, uh, the industry needed to uh, really pull its socks up and get a lot more concerned about uh, safety issues, particularly radiation safety issues, than it had, had up to that time been. Macmillan dismissed Leslie as an opinionated ass. More difficult to ignore were the voices emerging from America. 
One senator, Clinton Anderson, accused Britain of not telling the truth about wind scale. At stake, Macmillan believed, was the future of Britain's relationship with America. The full story of wind scale could not be revealed. It had to be covered up. The report would not be published. When it then came to be explained to the country, my grandfather realised how important it was going to be to reassure people. And so he covered it up. Plain and simple. Macmillan turned once more to William Penny's report into the fire. Although Penny accepted that the cartridges had spread the fire, he believed that the Winscale team themselves had been the primary cause of the accident because they had started the second nuclear heating too soon and too rapidly. This had been the moment on October the 8th, two days before the fire was discovered, when the Winscale team reheated the reactor, the second Vigna release. I don't believe that uh, the second nuclear heating did contribute to the fire in any way, shape or form, except that it evidently got the release going again, and it was during the uh, second phase, if you like, of the release that the fire started. But I don't believe that the um, second nuclear heating initiated the fire in any way. But Penny's conclusion gave Macmillan the opportunity he was looking for. A white paper was published. It left out much of the detail of Penny's report, but inserted a phrase which Penny had not used. The fire at Windscale had been caused by an error of judgment by the Windscale men. So my grandfather, um, as a fine editor of books, edited the report in such a way that he was then able to lay something on the table as if it was a relatively minor thing. Most politicians then regarded the Windscale fire rather as they might have regarded a minor accident in a, in a colliery. Happily the chaps got out, you know, that sort of thing. He really suggested the operators were a bit fallible and their judgment wasn't terribly good and the press latched onto it and um, so that was a very bad week for the operators there. The reaction then was very, very bitter because they felt that the, the, the blame which was not theirs had been by implication loaded onto them. They'd been made to look as though they didn't know what they were doing and they'd not, you know, and it was all their fault. On the day the white paper was published, Britain detonated a genuine megaton hydrogen bomb. It was a personal triumph for Penny. He wrote to his team in the Pacific, Glad you got it off on Friday. This took some of the sting out of Windscale. I expect to get to Washington on Sunday. Penny flew to Washington to take part in the first exchange of nuclear secrets with America since the war. They had a delicate and frosty first encounter in which nobody quite knew how much they were supposed to reveal. And that after this, the British thought, well, is this worth it? You know, are they ever going to tell us anything? And they decided, right, we'll just put our cards on the table. We'll show them what we've done. And uh, they went back into the room and revealed a full design. And uh, the Americans then left the room and had a 10-minute powwow. And they came back in and said, well, gentlemen, it's clear that the laws of physics apply in Britain in the same way that they do in the United States. Yes, I think the British were able to make a contribution and the Americans benefit to a certain extent, but of course the benefit to Great Britain um, is, is remarkable. Here we have access, not to all American um, nuclear secrets, but to a very substantial range of uh, nuclear technology, um, nuclear, nuclear secrets, uh, and for one power to share with another state those kinds of secrets, which are the, are the forefront uh, of its military security, I think is quite remarkable. Macmillan had secured Britain's place at the top table. But for the men who'd averted a tragedy at Windscale, it came at a great cost. 
Sir William, what caused the accident? Was it a failure of man or of gear? It was both. There was an error of judgment during a standard operation on the pile, called a Vigna release, but there were inadequacies of instrumentation which prevented the operators from being able to form a really reliable judgment. Error of judgment. The men who'd prevented a tragedy were now officially to blame for the fire. The fact that they seem to be blaming people for what they did and the wrong people at that, I think is, uh, was uh, very bad. But uh, we were resentful at the time. And I certainly think it was absolutely disgraceful to um, and then cast the blame at junior people who had no means of defending themselves. It's rather like putting a, a cake in an oven. If you haven't made the cake, you know, if it doesn't come out right, it's not, not your fault. Uh, that's how I've thought about it. But the people of Windscale were perhaps the first to realise that a new Britain was emerging. The trust between leaders, scientists and men which had been forged in wartime had begun to disappear. Most of the people on this site had been in the services, as had I. They were all accustomed to doing their best and they rather expected a pat on the back now and then. Um, and I think it came as a terrible shock when uh, uh, they were held up um, in the press as being, you know, inadequate. And that attitude lives on even now, 50 years later. Months later, the Americans visited Windscale. They met senior managers there, who described what had happened the previous October. They all held forth as though they fought the fire. And I was sitting there, not a single question was put to me, the man who dealt with the situation. <laughs> How did you feel about that? Well, if, <laughs> well, how polite do you want me to be? I thought, what a shower of bastards. <laughs> Newsnight next on BBC Two. Then, as part of the Y Democracy season, a gripping investigation into torture methods used in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Guantanamo Bay. Taxi to the dark side at 11:20. Like a Pollyanna, I should work.